go to the Capitol. That's one of the things that we do at Ember University. We've been taking large groups of students to the Georgia State Capitol and we'll introduce them to different areas of the legislature and the process. And, um, and then even with the community groups I work with outside of Emory, we do the same thing. Uh, for a lot of folks, they've never been to the Capitol in their states. And I think when you can show up, when you can feel it and see it with their own eyes, when you attend these committee hearings, when you when you testify and, and stand up for your communities um, with whatever your thoughts are and your beliefs are and your position is, that goes such a long way. And you start to understand exactly how the process works. Good evening. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third program in our Fall 2022 Spring 2023 Virtual Lecture Series. This program is entitled Skin in the Game, Turning Engagement into Votes. Gen Z civic engagement is loud visible on the streets and virtual on social media. They are engaged, worried about big issues and increasingly discontent with incremental or no progress in addressing them. The question is whether this energy will translate into votes. How do advocacy groups and political parties recruit young people? Some use aggressive tactics and build on anger. Some tap onto the passion for an issue or a partisan identity. And others just stay above the fray and appeal to the sense of civic responsibility and extol the power of voting. Who's listening to all these different messages and why? No matter the rate, at which young people turn out to the polls, they will play a pivotal role in the outcome of the midterms just a few short days away. This series is a collaboration among the Suffolk University Political Science and Legal Studies Department, GBH Forum Network, Ward Hall Forum, and the Washington Center. I'd like to thank the Lowell Institute for their generous funding, which makes programs like this possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce my friend, my colleague, Christina Coolidge, who's a faculty member of the Political Science and Legal Studies program at Suffolk University and one of the visionaries of this program. Christina. Thank you, Susan, and that was very sweet. Um, welcome everyone. I am very pleased to be here in the third of our series on youth voter participation or youth participation, because one of the themes that we have examined is that participation civically is not limited to just voting. It, younger generations, Gen Z, millennials, participate in all kinds of ways. We know they're active, but we also know that votes count. So we, in the, with the, the midterms looming next week, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that we really wanna talk about. And we'll probably ask all of you to put on your crystal balls, but this episode is not necessarily about what do you think will happen? We'll figure that out. I'm a political scientist. I don't project. I study what's already happened. But we do know that youth turnout and registration hit an all-time high in the 2020 elections. We know that there has been a lot of activism on the streets and online, including direct online actions that are new to a large extent, it's not, well, I guess that's a question for the panel. Is uh, shutting down a tip line online the equivalent of a sit-in or is it something new and different? 
So I look forward to hearing from all of you and having a fabulous discussion. So I wanna briefly introduce our panel tonight. We have Serena Saunders, who is Communications and Programs Coordinator at Running Start. Uh, ben Holden, who is a current data science grad student. And um, for my purposes, more importantly, he used to be my student and he's a Suffolk alum. Uh, we have Eric Gordon, who's a professor at Emerson College. Clarissa Unger, who is the co-founder and executive director of Students Learn, Students Vote. Adam Gismondi, who is the director of impact at the Institute for Democracy in Higher Education at Tufts University Tisch School. And we also have Hannah Joy Gebrela, sorry, Gebrela Selassie. I knew I was going to trip up on that and my apologies. And ha Hannah Joy is from Emory Votes Initiative. She's their program co coordinator in the Center for Civic and Community Engagement. So now I'm gonna throw this to Katie Lannon from GBH News, who is our moderator for this event. Katie, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Christina. And thanks to all our panelists who are prepared to share uh, their insights with us tonight and everyone who is tuned in for it. Uh, to kick things off, I think, Adam, I'd love to, to start with you. Maybe you can help set the table for us a little bit and tell us a little bit about what your institute has found in terms of student participation levels, youth engagement, and voting. Sure, um, and thanks for having us all here today, and thanks for the question, Katie. Um, we can take a look at, at some data that, uh, that our office found. And I, I would also preface this by saying that I would encourage you all to check out um, our peer institute here at Tisch College uh, Circle, who do youth civic engagement research broadly as well. Um, so from our office, we found that at the last midterm election, the college student voting rate doubled from midterm to midterm. So from 14 to 18, um, still fairly low, 40% uh, student rate in 2014, but uh, a doubling from 2014. So for us, uh, if we want to take a look at the next uh, image here, 99% uh, of the schools that participate in our study of uh, 1,200 colleges and universities increased their voting rate from, from midterm to midterm, from 14 to 18. And in 2020, it was a similar story. If you want to jump ahead here, um, the student voting rate nationally in 2020 was 66%. So two out of three students voted, um, which for the first time in, in our data of 10 years of research, uh, students actually match the national voting rate, which is a pretty incredible thing, um, considering some of the hurdles that students have uh, in front of them, which I'm sure we'll get into today. Um, and in 2016, that voting rate for students was only 52%. And I'll just point out that four out of five students that registered followed through to vote, which is a real uh, thing that we're focused on is what we call the yield rate, is how many students actually show up to vote, not just register. Um, if we can move ahead one here. Uh, similarly, 97% of the schools that we studied uh, increased from, 16 to, from 2016 to 2020. And lastly, uh, if we can move ahead here, yep. Um, to, to think about this visually, uh, about a quarter of students didn't register to vote in 2016. And then another quarter of students registered, but then didn't vote. Um, in 2020, both of those two rates dropped by 7% and then moved into the voter bucket. So um, we saw more students registered and then more of the students that registered actually showed up to vote. So um, some real hopeful signs uh, leading into 2022. And that, that's what we saw at the student level uh, in the last two elections. Great. So what does it take to, to kind of shift those bars around to get those students who are registered to, to show up and vote? Is there something even, you know, at this point with a week to go into the elections, is there a way to encourage more students to get out and cast those ballots? Um, I think that there, there'll be a, a plenty of others on this call that are, that are real specialists in this work as well, but I, I will just start off things by saying that um, having data like this to measure this is very helpful to have baselines, to set goals, to do your planning, and to see the granular numbers which, which we offer campuses um, 
a, a tailored look at each school on like how many students would vote in each major, how things are breaking out by sex, by race and ethnicity, um, et cetera. So that, that does help. But I think that those numbers are a reflection of the work happening on the ground on college campuses um, in terms of everything from thinking about the year round efforts to infuse political discussion and uh, connect what students are studying in the classroom with issues of public relevance. So there's a whole lot that goes into that, um, especially during um, things like a national and international pandemic. Um, pivoting and thinking creatively about problem solving and how to engage students. But like I said, I will, I will leave <laughs> some of that to um, the, the other panelists here. Great. Uh, Clarissa, I know you are doing this kind of work. What, what do you see there? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to jump in here and, and so happy to be here with you all tonight and happy to be here with so many colleagues that are a part of the Students Are in Students Vote Coalition which just to real quickly share is the national hub and largest nonpartisan network in the country working to increase college student voting rates. Um, I just wanted to add to what Adam shared and say that one of the um, specific ways that we at the coalition um, encourage campuses to actually move from just that registration piece to that voter turnout piece is by integrating celebrations and fun into the voting process. And so our team helps to lead a program called the Campus Takeover Program, which focuses on a number of different, what we call civic holidays. So you may have heard of National Voter Registration Day. We also run National Voter Education Week and a help with a holiday called Vote Early Day, um, which just took place last Friday. And I know there are some folks on this call who were very instrumental in organizing some of these celebrations on their own campuses. So I'm not sure if somebody else might want to jump in and show, talk a little bit about what that looked like on their own campuses. Yeah, I can take that and jump in there, Clarissa. It's super uh, exciting to partner with you all at Emory University doing that type of work. Um, what we're seeing is we got to meet people where they are, right? When it comes to civic engagement, when it comes to voting, we need to make sure we are tailoring to the youth, to the young people. We're going to have a DJ out there playing Afro beats, playing rap and hip hop and R&B and, and whatever music, you know, and I do want to take a moment while we're talking about music to just take a moment and pause and reflect and just um, make a small tribute to Takeoff, an artist who passed away today, who was well known, not just in the Atlanta community, but around the world and um, lost his life to gun violence. And it's something that has moved and shaken up communities. I'm kind of like, yeah, just everybody is, it, it's, it's just a painful time right now. So when we think about the power of artists, the power of music, people like Takeoff definitely use their, their, their gift to, to reach people. And I think when we think about civic engagement, when we think about voting, I hope we can continue to move in the spirit of people like take off and honor his legacy and so many others. So I just want to say rest in power and may we all continue to use our gifts to make this world a better place. I do want to key in on a couple of things that both Hannah and Clarissa, you've mentioned here, the idea of celebration of making it fun. Uh, you know, we're, we're still in a pandemic. We see a lot of bleak national headlines and negative talk in the political realm. How do you combat the negativity? Is there a way to to encourage people to still enter, or to still participate in political life and political space in the face of all of this? And I'll toss that out to anyone who wants to jump in. Okay, um, <laughs> don't mean to stop anyone there, but I, I can I can hop in on this. Um, you know, as uh, we all as a country um, been going through a lot, as you mentioned, the last couple of years, and um, you know, voting isn't always seen as the most fun thing. Even though I'm sure many of us on this call think that it's really fun and it's an act that should be celebrated. Um, and in 2018, our team started uh, along with our partners at the Alliance for Youth Organizing this campus takeover program. And surprisingly, throughout 2020 and the pandemic, we've seen more and more campuses that are participating in this way. Um, and in 
2022, so far we've had over 600 campuses and students participating in these civic holidays. And I think, you know, it's just really important, especially for students and young people to uh, help show, like Hannah was saying, you know, let's bring out DJs, let's make this a community event, uh, because voting really is for the community. So the more that we celebrate it and make it more like a holiday, um, we're seeing more and more campuses and folks and students and young people across the country really, really celebrate that, which I think is just a beautiful thing. Great. And Serena, I, I'd love to ask you, your organization works with young women interested in running for office. What do you say to young women about, you know, who might be nervous about entering a, a seemingly negative space, sometimes a, a toxic environment and why they should, you know, get around that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Running Start trains young women to run for office. So we train as young as 13 and as old as 30. Um, so for us, we really kind of meet both ends of the spectrum of political engagement. Um, we have people who are just kind of starting to get involved and people who are really like already thinking about next steps for running for office. Um, so to your question, I think that the first thing that we kind of impress upon them is that politics is a place where um, they can be seen and be heard. Um, it's not just um, for old white men who are going to talk over them, there are also plenty of people who um, really actually care about their voices and um, are part of their community and that um, public service in whatever way, shape and form they find it um, is a really meaningful endeavor because it helps um, themselves and it also helps their community. Um, and that's something that I think that most of our um, participants and alums really uh, connect with. Um, so really just making sure that they understand that like politics is not as scary as it seems on, on CNN and on MSNBC, right? Um, it's accessible. Um, it can be super fun. Um, I really, really love the, the work that SLSV is doing um, in terms of like the, the poll parties. I used to organize those at Maryland when I was a student there. Um, so, you know, it's not all, it's not all scary and it's not all arguing in large rooms in Congress and stuff, right? It's fun. It's uh, community-based and it's really interesting. So that's, that's kind of our first um, step for getting people in the door. Excellent. And we've talked about voting. We've talked about running for office. Eric, I, I'd love to hear from you maybe on some other ways that are out there for, for political engagement. What can be done to, to foster kind of civic participation when we're not talking about an election cycle directly? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks. And it's, it's good to be here. Um, I mean, I'll say that that uh, for for over a decade now, I've been working with with uh, government institutions and creating games um, often for uh, for political engagement. Not always voting, um, but just political participation. One of the things I've learned in doing that over time is is that um, you know institutions can present themselves as fun all they want, um, but but. But people, especially young people, see right through that, and and so the the challenge is that that we can sort of create this veneer of of a uh, playfulness of, of of and we can gamify processes, um, but ultimately, if we don't change the underlying values of the institution, then it's gonna it's gonna turn away it, it's gonna turn away young people from the from the process itself. And so one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about. Is, is how do we actually reflect a different set of values for institutions? I mean, trust in institutions in general is down across the board. The federal government is one of the least trusted of the, of the uh, institutions that are, that, that are measured here in the United States, um, but just generally institutional trust is down. So, um, and so what that means, what that says to me is that, that people are, especially young people, are less likely to, to feel a sense of, 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 of connection, authentic connection to an institution than say an older generation. And so the, 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 what seems to be effective is that institutions are now investing in influencers and other sorts of mechanisms to sort of um, to create kind of cultural resonances around particular issues um, and using the where, where students are or where young people are, um, you know, sort of culturally as a way to get them to, to take kinds of actions or have certain opinions, but it's not necessarily, at least from the institutional frame, not necessarily effective in getting them to, to participate in institutionally framed actions. And I'm afraid voting is part of that. So when I look at this landscape, 
you know, and and while you know, I I love what Adam shared about the about the uptick in voting among college students. That's incredibly um, uh, hopeful. Um, but at the same time, I feel like if institutions don't effectively make that change and and represent a value proposition um, that is actually legible to young people, then um, then we're not going to get anywhere, and that and that um, that increase in participation is 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 only going to decline. I would love to add to that. I think, you know, some of the disparities that we're seeing are tied to the past uh, that this country is reckoning with when it comes to the um, atrocious oppression of African Americans in this nation and how it's left residual impacts. You know, when you think about voting, right? Let's let's use that as an example. A lot of times uh, there are opportunities in some cases for more aff affluent wealthy white families to take their kids to the polls, make it a family function. Whereas you may have a single mother living in a community or somebody who is in a, a wonderful relationship who may just need to work longer or multiple jobs, who's African-American, who may not be able to take their kids with them to the polls. They have to go straight to the polls after work or they have to um, take on extra, extra opportunities to make ends meet. And this doesn't apply to everybody, but I'm just trying to lay out some examples here. I think it is important to recognize that, you know, voting, it should be a right for everyone. But unfortunately, the way this country has um, has had to face with its past, it's still not accessible for everyone. And so um, I think in order to embed this in the youth, right? We wanna get people in middle school, in elementary school, just like these families are able to take their little ones to the polls, we should be encouraging that for all families. So what can we do? We should make election day a holiday, right? But unfortunately, it's not nationally recognized. There's a lot of companies that can't, that do not give their employees that day off. So I think it's just really important to recognize that, you know, that civic engagement does start at an early age. And, and if we want to see more of that, we also have to invest resources in the community so we can close those gaps, those, um, those wage gaps and everything like that. And when it comes to reaching people in the community, I want to take a moment to shout out Crystal Greer, who's on there, who's uh, my fellow co-founder of Protect the Vote, a Georgia nonprofit organization that is a nonpartisan group. And we do voter mobilization to target specifically youth voters in Georgia. And one of the ideas is to go to a skating rink and skate to the polls. But that doesn't mean just provide skates. That means make sure there's going to be food served. Make sure there's going to be an opportunity for parents who are also going to be there. You want to make sure you're thinking about inclusivity with the entire family, because this is a family function and resources need to be shared in that way. Great, thank you. And and Ben, I think you have kind of an interesting perspective here as well as someone who's kind of looking beyond or apart from political circles directly for, for acting on the issues you care about. Tell me a little bit about what drove you to look outside of direct activism and organizing. Well, um, so, just for background, um, I was involved in student organizing in college, um, more drawn into the sort of the, the sensationalist culture war um, stuff, specifically on the right. And um, after not so much time, I, I recognized sort of how shallow um, that space could be. And particularly um, after having seen some of the, the sort of extra or some of the, um, how the movements operate beyond campus. Um, I didn't necessarily think it was the most productive use of time. I've since worked for some think tanks um, in the economic policy space. And I, I see that there are many opportunities there for people who are, um, who are interested in making a difference, but who feel like, um, say the parties and the, the hyper polarized environment doesn't necessarily fit them um and so you know i i was part of a chapter on campus at suffolk young americans for freedom and uh, it fizzled out after a while once i sort of realized that it wasn't again a productive use of time that something that professor conley actually from suffolk uh imparted on us very well was the opportunity cost of being involved, um, whether it be voting, which particularly for some presents more of an opportunity cost than than for others. Um, but also, the more involved you get, the more uh, 
the more difficult it can be for some people who simply have more important stuff to take care of. And so, and so looking beyond that, uh, I realized that, you know, I care about something that most people in my generation care about, which is climate change and, and energy and the environment. Um, and coming to that from a more, I guess, right of center perspective, um, I found more success with something like the ACC, the, the American Conservation Coalition, uh, in that it's more geared towards actually making a, a constructive bipartisan impact rather than ginning up kind of a culture war, uh, resentment and, and conflict. So, so being focused on that, there's tons of ways to impact things that, that don't necessarily involve voting, although I think obviously voting is a civic duty, but, um, but you can get involved in the private sector. Tons of stuff happens in the private, private sector in terms of renewable energies and that sort of thing. So, so that's where, um, interestingly, actually, a lot of those right-wing organizations are, are having problems retaining people because the, their talent pool tends to sort of get over the phase and then join industry where, where there's perhaps more of an impact. So, so that's kind of where I'm coming from with this. So I'd love to hear from some of the others on this call about a, a couple of things that Ben has raised. One of them is the idea of getting over a phase. How how do you, if you're looking to keep a population engaged, whether it's in direct political circles or still working on things in the private sector, how do you build lasting engagement? What what keeps it from being something people will leave behind after they graduate? Um, Serena, maybe I'll see if you have a thought yeah, there. I know I you're working with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think that one of the most impactful things that you can do for young people who are interested in politics and policy is really get them engaged in a community. Um, you know, have them find friends, like have them um, work with their department, like really create something for them to, um, to kind of exist in and not just for. Right. Um, you don't want people who are just focused on one issue and that's all they care about. And like they literally just vote and go home and that's all they do. Um, you want to build a community of people around them who um, are supporting their activism, who are, um, you know, bringing them to to volunteer events um, for campaigns who are really like kind of surrounding them in this culture of engagement. Um, so I think that that building that community is really critical to making sure that people don't just you know, vote throughout college and then get out of college and then say, well, that's it for me. Um, that was something I did before, right? Um, and I, I think that that's one thing that that Running Start does really well. We really try and build um, cohorts of, of young people who are actively engaged um, in politics. And I think that that's something that a lot of um, my other um, panelists on the call um, also really do a great job of, of making it a community event and building that support system around, you know, any single student who might be interested. Um, if I can just add on to that for a moment. Um, so in our office, a lot of times we do get questions about voting because we run this massive study of college student voting. But for us, the, the sort of irony is that we see elections as a checkpoint. We're, it's not the end for us. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to measure this work. And so for us, it's, it's one of many possible measures for it. And so that's sort of how we view it. And um, I think there's a real danger in only focusing work around elections. And so, which I think like sometimes when, when I start on a tear about this, uh, it can be surprising because like I, I see elections as important. There's like a whole lot of reasons why, um, but uh, what's really important is to not have like a this centered around these cyclical events. Um, the events are for attention and they they can kind of, get people in, into a system that then um, creates a little bit of a feedback loop and they get involved in other ways as well in their communities, um, whether they're, those are sort of local communities or, or larger. And so I think to some of what uh, Serena was, was saying and, and actually some of what Ben was saying as well, for colleges and universities, for us, one of the things that we really talk a lot about is um, get it like figure out who you are figure out what you care about and and put yourself into that that sort of work um and for some people that can be getting 
hyper involved in their, their local communities in their town. For some people that community is their campus or uh, maybe an affinity group at their institution. And then for people beyond campus too, people that are not necessarily students or part of a college community. Um, it's, so I just, just wanna make that point that like voting is, is one of the things. <laughs> if you had like a kind of uh, a, a wheel, it's one of the spokes on the wheel, but it's, it's not the end all be all of this, this. It's about figuring out kind of who you are as a person, what you care about um, and delivering yourself into that work and figuring out how best to, to accomplish some of your goals. I'd like to add to that as well. And I, I think that there is, um, I, well, I, I definitely agree that that voting is, the, is an important kind of um, uh, spot on the, in the life cycle of, of one's engagement. Um, but there's also this, this really big difference between kind of local engagement and, and even state, uh, certainly federal, but, but even state level engagement. And I wonder if we could talk about that for a second, because the you know, a lot of what we've been hearing is about that sense of community, that sense of place, um, that sense of connection. But then when we look at politics on a, on a state and national level, um, a lot of what we are engaged in is a, is, is a, a kind of war of misinformation of, of, you know, sort of like naysaying about truth and what's truth and what's not. And, and that feels very different than the kind of place-based um, immersion in community um, that that I think we often think about when we when we think about engagement, not necessarily this sort of information war that's happening on a, on another level. And that's that's I think another thing that we should think about with and what I was saying before about that kind of like um, that that kind of BS sniff test, right? Like that 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 there's if we continue to sort of um, do politics on this level of 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 um, you know sort of um, you know what's what's truth and what's not, uh, and and sort of traffic and 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 all sorts of misinformation. We're going to alienate people who are looking, who are again, who are looking for institutions to authentically communicate some sentiment of their position within public life. And if they can't do that, then young people are going to turn away. I think is a part of the story that we heard from Ben. But um, so I, you know, I think that that it, it's. I'd like us to sort of consider that difference between scale of politics and how we might think about engagement differently on those different scales. Yeah, Eric, I think that's really important. Um, and I want to mention, so our approach at the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition is really to identify a leader within every campus across the country. And we work with campuses in all 50 states um, that's willing to be the point person for their community um, hand, like Hannah is at Emory with Emory Votes, um, and really provide them with all of the resources and support that they need to be successful in their local context. Because as we've been talking about, voting is just one of many actions um, that many people can take to be civically engaged. It's sort of a baseline. Um, and it's a great way to bring people into the political and civic engagement process by getting them engaged. But as we've seen on campuses all across the country, Students don't necessarily want to identify with the national political parties, but an institution that they do identify with is their campus. And many of us also identify as alumni of the campuses that we attended. Um, and so instead of, you know, pushing out Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition chapters on, on campuses across the country, we want to help folks like Hannah um, create that identity of I of I go to Emory, I'm a voter. I vote because I love Atlanta. I'm an Emory voter. Um, and so I just think that's so important that it's always, we've got to bring it back to the local community um, and help make those connections for students and for young people about how much of an impact they can have in their local communities uh, by getting involved in, in the election process. I know a lot of you have kind of a, a focus on campuses and student voting, but what about the 70% of eligible voters in this age group who aren't in college? Is there, I don't know if any of you see a way to make sure they're connected with as well, or if those folks are engaged in the process? 
I just want to take a moment to certainly uplift the student organizations on campus. As Clarissa was mentioning, there's so many doing such powerful work. And thanks to support from folks like Students Learn, Students Vote, and Adam's team over at Tufts, you know, um, we are really able to mobilize within the institution. Now, these groups don't just do internal work. Some of them go out into the community and do work. They host community events where it's open to the public and, you know, tell a friend to bring a friend. So your friends may bring other people in the city or around the community who maybe aren't attending a college. And I think that, you know, we have to really make sure as individuals and all the students on this call that you don't see a hierarchy. You don't see um, a degree next to somebody's name. You see them first as a human being. And I think when we can start thinking like that before you introduce your master's degree or your doctor's degree you introduce your name because you're a person right and I think if we can embed that mentality like that thinking into younger folks and practice what we preach we'll really go further because then we can do more collaborations and as I mentioned some of the youth events that we're doing in the community outside of Emory as well with nonprofits in the community we're able to reach people through innovative ways, um, whether it is a mixer, a social event, whether it's a, a skating rink. And these are open to everybody and anything. You know, sometimes you leave off the question, what university do you attend or what college you attend? Because if someone doesn't attend, you're kind of isolating them in that questionnaire. So being really intentional about how you provide events and how you create them. Um, and I think like Clarissa mentioned, be intentional about partnering with the local groups on the ground. Those are the number one people you should be going to to see what's going on, what's the temperature, what's the pulse, what are people saying? And I think when you do that, you're, you're able to reach larger populations. Excellent. And on the, the subject of isolation, I know a lot of uh, campus political organizations can lean more progressive. Ben, as someone who's right of center, what what do you see as the role for for different ideologies in the you know kind of student organizing world? Well, part of the onus is on on the political minority in that sense to also not sensa sensationalize and paint. Um, so-called ideological opponents as bad actors and vice versa. Um, I think the the current environment where, um, as Eric touched upon, where where politics has become very sort of nationalized and and people sort of hook on to these like nationwide trends and 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 uh, operate in that sense. Like I think that can split people apart a lot more and and. Um, and preclude dialogue because at the end of the day people have differing perspectives and and I, I think it's the job of a college of a university and of a healthy political debate in a democracy to be able to air differences in a respectful kind of way where you don't question the motives of your your opponents right so and this is something that I've seen sort of degenerate um, in the United States, especially uh, during the Trump era, and, and that's kind of why me and many like me have sort of developed this kind of kind of um, almost an allergy to it because because it feels like you can't really reach across the aisle and actually establish a dialogue where where the 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 whole point is mutual understanding. So so I think that's also something that probably drives a lot of people away from it and and sort of draws in I can only speak for the right I can't really speak for the left in that sense but but it, it draws people in more to engender conflict rather than any kind of like intellectually honest uh, exchange of ideas and I think and I think that's pretty unfortunate um so and uh, I'll note too that the groups we have represented in this call describe their work as nonpartisan. So I'd love to hear from maybe Clarissa, Serena, how you go about that work of, of bridging the gap of forging connections. I can go first, um, Clarissa, if you don't mind. But uh, yeah, I think that for Running Start, we are both nonpartisan um, and we take a bipartisan approach. So we really we officially do not take stances on issues, candidates, anything like that, but 
Um, our goal is to prepare these young women to run for office. And we understand that that means that they have to learn um, how to actually talk to each other, right, um, when they are in office. Um, so that, um, you know, they're not just yelling at each other across the aisle, but they're actually coming to mutual understandings, like Ben said, about important policy issues that they will actually like have to work on. Um, so we really try and integrate that aspect of kind of conflict resolution and, um, you know, bipartisan um, thinking uh, into, into all of our programs. Um, so that's, that's what Running Start does. I would love to hear more from Clarissa about what you all do, because I'm always looking to learn more about how you actually facilitate these conversations. Yeah, so I will say we are pretty solidly in the nonpartisan space, uh, not bipartisan, which is a, a little bit different. And um, I'll just add a couple of things to that and, and reasons why that is. So the first, um, we do work directly with colleges and universities across the country um, who have to also remain nonpartisan um, and wouldn't work with us and wouldn't trust us if we did lean one way or another or took stances on various issues. Um, and just uh, so that everyone here knows, folks might be familiar, but one of the reasons that we do work directly with colleges and universities is because they are required by the Federal Higher Education Act to provide voter registration for their students. So when we started the coalition in 2016, we knew that a lot of campuses weren't complying with that. Um, and we saw that as such a, a low hanging fruit that um, campuses could and should be doing in order to help students you know, really start their civic engagement journey. Um, additionally, uh, we are nonpartisan. We love that because it is more inclusive, quite frankly. Um, the way that political parties work, um, you know, a candidate will get a list of potential or likely voters and they will spend their time knocking on the doors of those potential or likely voters and skip lots of voters in the process and not even talk to them. Through our efforts, and we have a program at the coalition called Ask Every Student, um, where we work with campuses on integrating an ask um, to register to vote, to be politically engaged of every single student on their campus. And so, um, you know, we, we are very nonpartisan because we work with colleges and universities directly and because we truly believe that it is much more inclusive. And, and we had a, a mention earlier of some of the hurdles that students face in, in getting out to vote. Uh, Hannah, I, I'd love to, you know, since you work directly with students, how, how do you go about solving those hurdles? What kind of things do you find students in need of to order in order to actually get to the polls? There's a lot of need on campuses. And I mean, I can't emphasize enough the importance of remaining nonpartisan because we wanna be able to serve everybody on campus in our network in the community. And uh, a lot of times we'll get asked by students who move to Georgia, right? And they're out of state and they'll say, hey, um, you know, am I allowed to vote in Georgia? Or I want, I wanna vote in Georgia, what do I do? And then we are able to educate them. And the first thing we say is, we are a nonpartisan organization and we do not tell you where to vote. You have the right to vote in your home state or you can choose to vote in Georgia, which is the school uh, state where you're attending school. The choice is yours. We do not sway voters as a nonpartisan entity. And that is extremely important um, because for many reasons, right? Uh, just you don't want to compromise that integrity and um, and trying to sway people on, on which way to vote. So that's something that we train all of our volunteers on, our interns, our team, that everybody knows that. Um, and so when I respond to email inquiries, if people are asking us for support, I always make sure to mention that. I mean, we've we've gotten questions where, you know, a student may say, well, I heard, you know, um, my vote may count more here or there. And, I, and then we just do not engage in that. We say, sorry, we are not able to, you know, inform you on that. We're just here to provide resources and nonpartisan tools. Um, along with that, you'd be surprised how many folks have never looked up a sample ballot or seen what's all on the on the ballot. And so we are able to direct them to nonpartisan resources like the Secretary of State, of course, which is a go to every state has one. And um, they're able to look at their sample ballot there, whether they're in Georgia or an, at a state. And then we also direct them to resources like Ballotpedia, which also offers a breakdown of candidates. And then in, in Georgia specifically, there's an awesome tool. I want to shout them out. They're called Branch, branch.vote. They were founded by a, a, a college grad in, in Atlanta from Georgia Tech. 
And um, I just really want to uplift their tool because it is nonpartisan. They break down the Republican candidates, the Democratic candidates, the independents, whoever is running the libertarians, and they make sure that people have that info in an easy and digestible way. So part of our job is to make sure people have access to those types of tools. And I'm going to turn over to some student questions here. But before I do that, I do want to note, as mentioned in the chat, that for those of you joining us from Massachusetts, the Secretary of State's website here has a lot of that same information uh, for the Bay State that Hannah was just talking about. Um, so Chris, if you want to start us off with the student question portion. Yeah, I'd be. I will gladly do that. Uh, so my name's Chris. I'm a political science student at Suffolk University. Uh, so I, along with most of my generation, are on social media, but when it comes to receiving information on different policies or campaigns, I feel like I'm not receiving an adequate amount. I believe that many forms of promotion for campaigns circulate towards an older audience, such as my parents. Do you feel politicians could be prioritizing youth votes better? if they promoted more on social media? And what would that look like? I'll take a stab at that question. Um, so I mentioned before the, the, the role of social media influencers in, in politics, and I, I'm completely fascinated by, um, by, by this trend. I mean, so we can take a look at um, President Biden's use of of uh, TikTok uh, influencers um, uh, in, with, at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, um, and and so so you know Biden Bi Biden sort of called a called a meeting with uh, with with some folks on TikTok um, had a had a thing with a or had a had an event with Olivia Rodrigo um, to get her to um, to promote some things um, in in her channels, and so there uh, we have a a, a national politician. Who is trying to get some um, trying to get messaging out through through these channels? What's super interesting about that is that where Biden went wrong, I think, with Olivia Rodrigo in particular, was that he invited her to the White House um, as opposed to going to her spaces, right? And I think this is a kind of an interesting challenge here. And what we're seeing on a local level um, is we're seeing more of the contracting out of social media influencers to spread um, to spread information about particular things. So for example, there's a company called Zomad um, that, that their, their whole uh, business model is actually uh, contracting social media influencers for campaigns. Um, they'll work with city governments or other kinds of governments and they'll, they'll actually uh, have information campaigns around, uh, around um, um, vaccination or um, around insurance programs, and they'll and they'll sort of move people into the spaces by getting micro and nano influencers to spread different kinds of messages. So, and of course, they have to say that they're being paid by um, by whatever organization or institution to to um, for that to work. But what's super interesting um, is that. Uh, is that you have just what you're saying or what you're asking is that there is this sort of move towards um, not communicating via government channels, but instead uh, going to existing channels and spreading word, spreading the word through people that are already trusted, um, that are often called trusted messengers, a, a phrase I don't love, but, but are often called trusted messengers. They can spread the word, whereas the institution can't do it. So if that's a, I don't know if that's a, if that's a positive development or, or a really, really scary one, you know, because in a way it's institutions are sort of deferring their responsibility to be effective communicators to existing influencers on social media. That's one way of looking at it. And another way of looking at it is like, finally, they're using some effective mechanism to get the word out. So it's a, it's, I think it's a complicated issue. Eric, if I could just follow up there, you talked about the importance of trust in institutions. Does this kind of influencer outreach read as sincere when it's the president doing it? Or does it come across as, you know, oh, a 79-year-old is trying to pretend to know what young people like? Yeah, I think the the, the case of the president doing it, 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 it just kind of, um, it was a misfire, right? It didn't, it didn't work for all the reasons, for the reason that you just said, I think. 
where it is working, um, you know, there there is a the, the use of influencers in um, in in vaccination campaigns have been very effective, actually. Uh, and so that's interesting, right? So the message coming from government offices saying get vaccinated, that's not going to work. But the message coming through government offices where that message is even like the, the core of the message is then shared with micro and nano influencers. And those those influencers are then sharing like, hey, here's how here's how here's why I got vaccinated or here's a cool reason to get vaccinated. That's coming across. That's landing. And so and that data is out there. Right. The data shows that these campaigns are effective. Um, and so there are more and more government institutions that are doing it. So I think the question is, does it result in the institution being more trusted or does it result in, in something that that I've been exploring? Is it just really just like a proxy? Right. Is it just a is it the institution actually creating a proxy so that the influencer is trusted? And it doesn't actually do anything in the long term for the institution, but it effectively gets the message out. And when and when institute and when governments are in crisis mode, like we have been with the pandemic, the primary the primary uh, motivation was to get the message out. And so I think right now we're in this we're in this like non crisis mode, perhaps, where we can start thinking about like, okay, what we've seen this in crisis mode. What would this look like if we apply this to a non crisis situation? And I'll, I'll throw this right back at uh, Chris here or any of the other students. Do you see this kind of messaging resonating? Does it does it work the way it's intended? Yeah, I mean, I can speak on this. I think sometimes it works, but like the example you said before with President Biden, I think sometimes they do misfire and definitely miscalculate how the effective they think different promotions will work. And what about Ben from your experience? Do you do you find this clicking with you and your peers? Mostly I I, I think it garners ridicule and um and um some there there's a very irreverent uh attitude among many in our generation uh towards politics and towards everything that goes on like that. And so and so that's a it's a tough it's a tough way to try to engage with people through TikTok where um where that irreverence definitely shows up and and so in my experience it it gets treated with a lot of humor but um but also in a sardonic kind of way where it's kind of like well you know that cynicism still creeps in unfortunately I would like to weigh in too from my perspective as um, someone that is considered a micro influencer on social media, um, tens of thousands of followers. And I can tell you that it, for me, it, it's, it seems like it depends on the messaging, right? Like if I'm talking about something very serious, I, you know, making it like an influencer post may be a little, it may turn some people off, but when it comes to voting or something more, you know, people, people receive it, right? Like I did a whole photo shoot with like vote and like, it was just neutral colors and I did my makeup, my hair. And it was like, I mean, several hundreds of thousands of likes and shares and all kinds of things. So I think um, it does depend on the content and the, and the messaging and the subject at hand. But I've found that uh, a lot of Gen Z and millennials do seem to receive some of that, some of those campaigns really well, depending on the subject. And I think Hannah, the the audience there is probably key too, right? You'd want to be speaking to your existing followers. Yeah, I think when you make it relatable to your, you know, I wouldn't come to maybe someone on here who's not so skilled in, you know, for example, I'm I'm Ethiopian and Eritrean, and we drink coffee a lot, right? We do it from from raw bean. We roast it and then we brew it, right? I don't know if I would ask one of you all to do the whole ceremony in an IG live and share it with the world, right? That may make sense for me to do it, but maybe, maybe, maybe one one of y'all. But like, you know what I mean? You wouldn't, you wouldn't all tap into that. So I do believe it depends on the subject. Great. And I, I was just gonna say, I think that for influencers too, there's just. Um, a risk of sort of the reverse where they're dragging down their own brand um, depending on the cringe level of what it is that they're that they're posting and, and how insincere it comes across 
Um, and I think that there was a, a, a specialness and uniqueness to when Barack Obama went on Between Two Ferns with Zach Galifianakis and it was kind of a new thing and it, it had like a little bit of a, a viral splash. Um, but now it's, there's, I think there's like a risk of like overdoing it too um, and depending on how it's done. Great, thanks uh, Chris for your question and everyone for batting it around. Uh, we'll go to Sophia for the next student question. Hi, thank you all for having me here tonight. As an international student from Mexico, I was surprised to see how young people in the United States share their political views on social media on a regular basis, which is not a common tendency in my country. My question is, do political views that are shared on social media act as barriers of communication that increase polarization, or does it create a sense of community that could lead to a greater participation? I mean, let's talk about the First Amendment, right? I think um, here in this country, we should be able to share that freely. And I think, um, and unfortunately, sometimes that's not always the case in, in, in some of our uh, neighboring or, or fellow countries around the world. And so I think when you are able to share it, if you can do, if you can have that dialogue in a respectful way, right, where you are, again, we're humans talking to each other, we may not agree, but I think that being able to share that to me, it, it seems empowering. Now they do have to know that when you do that, you may have some pushback. I remember when I was posting some stuff years ago, I got, I got death threats, I got things that came my way. And you have to know that you just have to know that once you put it out there and it's a public page, even if it's a private page, people can screen record and screenshot. It's out there for the world to see. So just, you know, move cautiously. But I also think that it's empowering to share those perspectives. Yeah, I'll also weigh in on that. Um, I think, I think, like Hannah's talked about a lot, again, it, the, the feedback you get from other people depends on what the message is. Uh, and um, when it's something sort of neutral or positive, like go out and vote, exercise your right to vote, exercise your First Amendment, um, that's one thing. But whenever it gets into a particular issue that people care about a lot, um, I think the incentive structure of a lot of social media, uh, thinking specifically of something like Twitter here, um, I think is more combative and can um, definitely drive polarization. That's, a, that's at least something that I've experienced where where a lot of the times, even if you have a sort of firm opinion on something, um, and almost no matter how you voice it, the way it's received it's, is, is through this kind of ideological lens of either people really agree with you and they're part of your tribe, or they're on the opposite side. So, so, I, think, so I think that kind of an environment definitely, like people are incentivized to speak their minds, which is good. I just think we have a cultural problem in terms of um, whether it's algorithmically, sorry, sort of like how how these um, kind of that how tribalism is fed through um, through uh, algorithms, but also uh, but also more generally how we kind of talk to each other um, in the political realm. I think that turns a lot of people off, but but also the toxicity gets sort of gets sort of fed through a feedback loop which which is unfortunate yeah if i could add in um i think that one thing that that both hannah and ben touched upon it was like this lack of nuance that social media sometimes creates um it's just so much harder to get across like complex ideas in a 280 character tweet um and it's even harder to do that when it's a very sensitive issue um but i do like completely see the flip side of of um that perspective and that um, Sophia, to your question, I think that social media really creates an opportunity for really positive niche, like micro communities. Um, like there's this Facebook group called NumTots, um, New Urbanist Memes for Transit-Oriented Teens. Um, it started out as like a meme group and it's really grown into like this community, of, like hundreds of thousands of people um, who are all concerned about urbanism in their own communities. Um, and they're like local groups that are offshoots of that. Um, and it's really like, I love being in NumTop because it really provides me a lot of different perspectives on urbanism. And um, like, I can actually see that nuance playing out there. Um, and thanks, Holly, for, for posting the link there. 
Um, but like, I can actually see the nuance playing out there. And I actually get to hear from people who I never would have met in person um, if it wasn't for this online uh, community. So I really, I really do think that there is a really great opportunity there, but it has to be, um, it has to be very intentional, I think is, is the point of, of my perspective, at least, um, is that social media has to be intentional about like building community. And it's really tough to do that, like tougher than, than most people would think. Excellent. Thank you, Sophia. And we'll have our final student question from Cameron. Uh, thank you, Katie. And thank you, of course, to GBH and all the panelists. This has been a really interesting discussion. Uh, I think it was Eric who first brought up these lower levels of trust in government. And that's certainly something that I've seen reflected in my own personal experience. So many people, especially young people, feel that longstanding institutions like the filibuster, the Electoral College, and the Supreme Court are broken, and that our elected officials are unwilling or unable to fix them. So how do we keep trust and keep faith in a system that so many people feel is working against them? I'd love to jump in. Uh, thank you, Cameron, for that question, and Sophia and Chris as well. Thank you all for your questions. I would say get out there. Uh, go to the Capitol. That's one of the things that we do at Ember University, we've been taking large groups of students to the Georgia State Capitol and we'll introduce them to different areas of the legislature and the process. And, um, and then even with the community groups I work with outside of Emory, we do the same thing. Uh, for a lot of folks, they've never been to the Capitol in their states. And I think when you can show up, when you can feel it and see it with your own eyes, when you attend these committee hearings, when you when you testify and, and stand up for your communities um, with whatever your thoughts are and your beliefs are and your position is, that goes such a long way and you start to understand exactly how the process works, right? Everyone says vote and then stay connected with your politicians. So all the things that they said, make sure you're holding them accountable. So I think showing up is a big part of it and, um, and just staying, staying engaged with the political process and paying attention. And if you can't make it, because we know everybody it can't may not be able to make it, right? Even just like following them on social media, even though we know sometimes they're not, they don't post a lot, but the parts that they do, Post, right and then and keeping up with your local news uh, paying attention to some of that the those nonpartisan uh, news outlets and, and and organizations that are sharing content on a regular basis because um, in Georgia we've seen a lot of bills passed obviously in the last couple of years we saw SB 202 we saw redistricting in all of our states um, and so it's changed the way voting is being conducted um, whether people some people think it's for the best some people think it's for the worst I think um, it's important to stay in the know But are we asking young people to show up to participate in the institution that is, or are we saying that the inst are we saying that the institution actually needs to be able to transform to meet um, different expectations of young people? And I think one of the challenges with institutional thinking is like, yeah, yeah, you should participate, come over to hang out with us. But but unless there's some indicator that that institution is actually tr trying to do things different and expressing a different value proposition then it's hard to keep asking people to show up, um, to keep asking people to participate in this, in, in this, as Cameron said, this system that, that feels broken. And I just wanna for a moment, bring it back to the local level. Um, you know, we do see some of these changes on, you know, in, in the space of local government, where local government is trying to do things differently, trying to, um, you know, incorporate uh, uh, citizen participation in, in, in different ways that are actually effective um, that, that actually have an effect on decision making. We see this in other institutions like news organizations that are also confronted with, a, with an, an existential dilemma. Like if we don't do things differently, um, you know, we will go away, right? We need to build trust in our audience bases in order to function. We see this with health organizations as well. And so I think that this is the problem with when we get to the state and the, and the federal level of political institutions, I think the institution needs to meet um, meet young people where they're at, just like other levels of institutions are doing. We see this really exciting transformation in certain levels of institutions, and I'm personally not seeing that on the on the state and federal level right now. And and so like, I I'm I'm just excited, or or I want to, you know, encourage it for young people to participate there needs to be some demands. It's like, no, we're not gonna participate on your terms, but there's gonna, there's gonna have to be a change in terms for us to, for, for us to participate. And, and that's gonna take a collective effort. 
I would like to piggyback onto that. I'm not saying that the current institution is where it should be by any means. There is a lot of change that certainly needs to happen, but I don't have time to sit on the sideline and watch the building burn down. So in the meantime, I'm gonna show up and work where I can. Now, one of the things I like to preach in our communities is that everybody plays their role. That's why I said, you may not be able to make it to the Capitol. We have people who are working in grocery stores, working in hospitals, working as teachers, teaching our little ones. Everyone plays their role. So in my opinion, you should play your role in the best way you can and understand that we're a collective. So when, when a group is advocating at the Capitol or when a group is out there, that's a that's a group that is representing your state or your communities, right? Um, and I know we have differing perspectives as well. But I think uh, one tangible way you can make a difference is, I'm going to say it again, by showing up because then you understand how the institution is flawed and how you can change it. In Georgia, the Secretary of State released a new voting system with my voter page where they updated the website and it, it took a while for it to get through some kinks. And because we were so involved in that process, we were able to see firsthand what those issues were, what those bugs were, and we were able to sound the alarm. We were able to raise flags, red flags around, hey, this is a, this is a problem. It needs to be fixed. People cannot view their sample ballot by logging onto the My Voter page, right, for the primary election this past May. So because we were so involved in the system, we were able to know that, hey, this is a red flag, and we knew exactly who to go to, where to go to, and how to, uh, how to help change that, and that was an effective strategy. So I think it's a combination of every everything changing the system, but also fighting and working within the system. And I want to just key in on something Eric said there, and maybe this is a question for you, Eric, or for some of the folks working on campuses and with students. What what are the changes that the government that government institutions need to be doing to bring young people into the fold to become responsive to their needs? Well, I think one really easy place to start is that we need to welcome them in better. Young people, when they turn 18, there's no uh, welcome packet uh, for how to become a voter. <laughs> um, we are starting to see some you know, local election officials do a better job of showing up on social media and so showing up in the places where young people are. Um, but we have to welcome them in. We can't just expect young people and new voters and um, to know how to get politically engaged to know how to um, go out and vote and register and, and do so many things beyond that in the political realm. Um, and that's why I think it's so important, all of the work that the folks here on campuses do, um, that yeah, it would be great if we had more civic education in middle schools and high schools, but um, at the very least, you know, we can, once folks turn 18 and they're at the college level, um, we have a responsibility to help welcome them into that process. And I, I would also say that um, it's a tricky question you raised, Katie, because um, our, our government is to some extent a reflection of the, the population, but it's a little bit of a funhouse mirror reflection at the moment. It's not uh, a fully representative group of people that are, that are managing our government, depending on which sector of the government you're looking at, especially. Um, and so there, there is this problem of like, at what point do you get on the, the circle of how these things work or um, whichever uh, progress uh, <laughs> you, wanna, you wanna describe it as. I, I think like, this is why it's important that, that young people get out there and get engaged because that's how um, the process can begin. It's one of the, the on-ramps to um, working towards a more representative government, which in turn, I believe, would be um, more representative in terms of its actions and in, and in terms of representing the issues that, that people care about. Um, and the, the youngest generation that we have, both within college and not non-college youth, um, is the most diverse generation that we've ever had. And I think that, um, you know, if we want to kind of have the sneak move to the end of the tail and, and, and see kind of where um, where the government starts representing the, the people that it's serving, people need to, to get involved sooner than later. I think that that time is, uh, is not on our side in that, in that stance. We've got to move now. All right, I think that, uh, that kind of call to action there might be a, 
a good note to end on as we wind things down here. Um, Christina, if I can uh, send it back to you for a final word. Uh, sure. I've got lots of words, <clears throat> but that's a problem of being a professor. So like hanging out in the background has been really, really hard, but this was a fabulous conversation and we raised, you raised, I didn't raise, you raised issues that each could obviously um, be its own webinar, its own seminar. But I think a common theme is that we need more open conversation. We need more civil conversations and we need more long term, long form discussion and um, a civic education that comes from schools, from families, from communities that encourages sticking sticking in there, right? Not pulling up your marbles and going home if you don't get the result that you want the first time around. So I appreciate all of you for your contributions, for what you're doing in terms of youth engagement. I am very appreciative of our audience. I hope you have listened to this and are inspired. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night, and I hope to see you all again soon.